The famous warrior Sultan Saladin won a victory at Hattin that allowed him to conquer the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. Saladin achieved this spectacular triumph some two years after the death of Baldwin IV, the leper king of Jerusalem. Had Saladin faced Baldwin at the Battle of Hattin, would he have gained his famous victory? Baldwin IV, leper and crusader, was one of the outstanding commanders of his age and, during his life, posed a worthy challenge to the valorous Sultan. In his titanic struggle, Saladin had considerable advantage. He controlled the territory around Baldwin's tiny kingdom and he had far larger armies at his disposal. What's more, the young king also suffered from a grave illness, leprosy. Despite his disease, and despite the fewness of his men, Baldwin the leper rode at the head of his knights, sword in hand, battling Saladin's legions on more than one occasion. Driven by a strong Christian faith, he was committed to defending Jerusalem no matter the cost. Today, we'll delve into the life, struggles, victories and defeats of this truly remarkable youth who stood against an empire even as he suffered the horrors of leprosy. This is Real Crusades History, the life of King Baldwin IV, the leper king of Jerusalem. In the summer of 1161, a baby boy was born to Amalric, Count of Jaffa, and his wife Agnes of Courtney. Amalric was an important lord in the Kingdom of Jerusalem, a small kingdom established some six decades earlier by Frankish knights, that is, knights from Western Christian Europe, as a result of the remarkable victories of the First Crusade. The purpose of this kingdom was to safeguard those places made holy by the life of Christ, in particular Jerusalem, the city where he'd been crucified and risen. But the Crusader Kingdom was surrounded by enemy territory, for it existed alongside many powerful Muslim states. Jerusalem too was holy to the Muslims, the location of the night journey of the Prophet Muhammad. Thus, Amalric's baby was born into a kingdom at war, the battleground between Christian and Muslim in the great struggle known as the Crusades. Amalric's son was christened Baldwin, named for Amalric's older brother, who was none other than Baldwin III, the King of Jerusalem. At the baby's baptism, the king himself stood as godfather. Apparently, the king joked that for a christening gift, he would like to give his little nephew the Kingdom of Jerusalem. At the time, this must have seemed unlikely, for Baldwin III was young and newly married to a beautiful Byzantine princess. However, two years later, King Baldwin III would unexpectedly die childless, and his brother Amalric would become the new king. As Baldwin III's only brother, Amalric was the undisputed heir to the throne of Jerusalem, and yet the lords and clergy of the high court would not confirm Amalric unless he put aside his wife, Agnes. This was not because Agnes was unqualified to be queen. She was daughter of Jocelyn II of Edessa and belonged to one of the kingdom's most prestigious families. But her family had lost their ancestral lands. In 1144, when the county of Edessa was conquered by the powerful Turkish ruler Zengi of Mosul, could it be that the high court was concerned that Agnes, should she become queen, might use her influence to expand her family's power at the expense of the traditional noble houses of Jerusalem? Scholars aren't sure, but there's no question. To become king, Amalric had to agree to have his marriage with his wife annulled. However, the High Court agreed to recognize the children born previously to Amalric and Agnes as legitimate. This meant that two-year-old Baldwin was now in line for the throne, as was his older sister, Princess Sibylla. Baldwin saw little of his mother. After her separation from Amalric, Agnes would have only encountered her son on public occasions. He saw little of his sister as well, for Sibylla was sent to be educated at the Monastery of Bethany, where her great-aunt Jovetta was abbess. When Prince Baldwin was six, his father married again. The king's new bride was Maria Comnena, a princess from the imperial family of the Byzantine Empire, 
but there's little evidence of any close relationship between Queen Maria and her stepson. King Amalric wanted to ensure that his son had the best possible education, and so he appointed as the boy's tutor William, Archdeacon of Tyre, one of the most learned men in the kingdom. It was William who first identified illness in young Baldwin. In his chronicle, William recounts with sadness how he came to suspect that Baldwin had leprosy. The boy, then about nine years old, was accordingly committed to my care to be instructed and nurtured in liberal studies. While he was under my charge, I devoted myself to my royal pupil with vigilant care and watched over him with the solicitude befitting his exalted position. He was playing one day with his companions of noble rank when they began, as playful boys often do, to pinch each other's arms and hands with their nails. The other boys gave evidence of pain by their outcries, but Baldwin, although his comrades did not spare him, endured it altogether too patiently, as if he felt nothing. At first, I suspected that it proceeded from his capacity for endurance and not from lack of sensitivity, but when I called him over, I discovered that his right arm and hand were partially numb. The lad's father was informed of his condition, and physicians were consulted. It is impossible to refrain from tears while speaking of this great misfortune. King Amalric called on a Christian Arab physician, Abu Suleiman Dawood, to treat his son's illness. He employed the physician's brother, Abul Qayyir, to teach the prince to ride war horses. This was an essential skill for a Frankish ruler who was expected to put on armor and lead his knights into battle. In particular, a Frankish knight had to learn to control his horse with his knees, for he would be wielding his shield and his lance as he charged the enemy. By all accounts, Prince Baldwin excelled as a horseman. At this point, he showed no major symptoms of his illness, and indeed, he would ride alongside his knights for many years to come. In the 12th century, leprosy was thought to be contagious and curable only by God. But the Franks believed in a certain holiness in the seriously ill. People were frightened of catching the disease, but they also sought to care for lepers with charitable works. In the 1140s, the Order of St. Lazarus was established in the Kingdom of Jerusalem to minister to lepers. This order contained knights who'd contracted leprosy and who would continue to fight until they became too ill. Amalric must have worried that disease might hinder his son from performing his future role as king. He was keenly aware of the precarities of the royal line. His father, Fulk, had died in a hunting accident, and his brother, Baldwin III, had succumbed to illness at only 33 years of age. But then, it was Amalric himself who died unexpectedly. He was campaigning, leading his army against the fortress of Banias where he accepted favorable peace terms with the government of Damascus. As the Christian army struck camp, the king complained that he didn't feel well. By the time they reached Tiberias, he was suffering from dysentery, and once they arrived in Jerusalem, Amalric was seriously ill. There, the king died on July 11th, 1174. He was 38. At the death of the king, the high court convened, bringing together all the important lords and clergymen of the kingdom. Prince Baldwin was endorsed unanimously as the new king of Jerusalem. This was no mere formality. The high court was the most important governing body in the kingdom of Jerusalem. All members of the high court, the king included, had to abide by its decisions. It was not yet certain that Baldwin had leprosy. He had early symptoms of the disease, but showed no outward manifestations or disabilities associated with the illness. Baldwin was 13 when he took the throne. He was crowned on Monday, July 15th, 1174. This date was chosen intentionally as it marked the 75th anniversary of the Crusader conquest of Jerusalem in 1099. The crown was placed on the boy's head by the patriarch and he was enthroned in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as Baldwin IV, sixth Latin king since the founding of the kingdom. 
William of Tyre must have beamed with pride at this moment. In his chronicle, he offers a memorable portrait of the new monarch. He was comely of appearance for his age, and far beyond the custom of his forefathers, he was an excellent horseman and understood the handling of horses. He had a very good memory and loved conversation. He was economical, but always remembered both favors and injuries. In every respect, he resembled his father, not alone in his face, but in his entire mien. Even his walk and the tones of his voice were the same. His intellect was keen, but his speech was somewhat halting. Like his father, he eagerly listened to history and was well disposed to follow good advice. Baldwin IV's kingdom was considerable and prosperous, but also precariously positioned. The Frankish Crusader states included the whole coastal territory of Syria and Palestine from the Amanus Mountains to the Sinai Desert. In the north, the Principality of Antioch and the County of Tripoli were independent, though they cooperated closely with Jerusalem. The Kingdom of Jerusalem stretched from Transjordan in the southeast, with its great castle of Kerak, to Gaza and Ascalon in the southwest. From there, it stretched north all along the coast, including many important port cities – Jaffa, Asuf, Acre, Tyre, Sidon, and Beirut. It included the area around the Sea of Galilee, with its principal fortress of Tiberias, and of course, it included the sacred cities of Jerusalem and Bethlehem to the west of the Dead Sea. However, the kingdom was dwarfed by the great empire of Saladin, who ruled the wealthy lands of Egypt, as well as important Muslim territories in Syria, such as the Emirate of Damascus. Nevertheless, at the time of Baldwin IV's ascension, the kingdom of Jerusalem was strong and economically prosperous. Its coastal cities were a crucial trading hub in the Mediterranean where Muslim, Christian, and Jewish merchants all did good business. Members of all faiths lived well within Crusader territory, practicing their own rights and governing their own affairs, so long as they maintained allegiance to the Frankish kings. Castles along the eastern and southern frontiers protected the territory from invasion, but there were vulnerabilities in the kingdom's defenses, especially when facing an enemy as powerful as Saladin. Recently, Saladin had emerged as the most substantial antagonist of the Crusaders, a Kurd born in what is today Iraq. Saladin rose from humble origins to become prominent at the Zengid court in Syria. Eventually, he rebelled against his Zengid masters and established his independence as the Sultan of Egypt. Here, Saladin was well positioned to expand his power, for Egypt was rich and could support enormous armies. Shrewd and endlessly adaptable, Saladin proved to be a highly capable ruler, as well as a brave and cunning military commander. He was also a man of deeply felt faith, profoundly inspired by his Muslim religion. For him, the Crusader states were an abomination, and he'd vowed to avenge the conquests of the First Crusade by driving the Franks into the sea. At 13, Baldwin IV was still considered a minor. The High Court appointed a regent to govern until the king turned 15, Raymond III, Count of Tripoli. A relative of Baldwin's, Raymond was a powerful lord in the kingdom, married to the Princess of Galilee, whose lands he held as well as his own county of Tripoli. William of Tyre leaves behind a vivid description of him. He was a slight-built, thin man. He was not very tall and he had a dark complexion. He had straight hair of a medium color and piercing eyes. He carried himself stiffly. He had an orderly mind, was cautious, but acted with vigor. He was restrained in his eating and drinking, and although he was liberal to strangers, he was not so affable toward his own men. When Raymond became regent, Baldwin's mother Agnes also returned to court, while the late Amalric's wife Maria retired to her fief at Nablus. Agnes began to wield considerable influence at her son's court. Having been absent from her son's life, Agnes tried to build a relationship with Baldwin. Historian Bernard Hamilton says, Baldwin no doubt welcomed the presence of his attractive and capable mother, who was genuinely concerned about his health and whom he could trust to take charge of his household efficiently. 
Given the circumstances of his childhood, his relationship with her must have been more like that between nephew and aunt than between son and mother. It was during this period that William became Archbishop of Tyre, appointed by Raymond in 1174. Also, Agnes gave the archbishopric of Caesarea to a clergyman called Heraclius. The chronicler Ernul says that Heraclius was her lover, and this sensational story has become widely known, but it's impossible to verify and originates with one of Agnes's political enemies. Meanwhile, Saladin continued to expand his power. Ever since the death of his greatest rival, his old master Nur ad-Din of the Zengid dynasty, Saladin chipped away at Zengid holdings in Syria. After seizing Damascus, Saladin went to war with Gumushtakin, who ruled Aleppo on behalf of Nur ad-Din's son, As-Sali. He captured Homs from the Zengids, as well as Kafartab and Marat an numan At last, Saladin agreed to a truce with the Zengids, but Aleppo seemed liable to fall eventually into the Sultan's power. During this time, Raymond of Tripoli failed to act militarily to check Saladin's progress. Rather than allying with the Zengids, Raymond made a truce with Saladin in 1175, which William of Tyre describes as not to our advantage. William's judgment seems sound, for Saladin had written to the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad, claiming that his wars against the Zengids were only a means to unite all of Islam so that he might attack the Franks and restore Jerusalem to Muslim rule. In 1176, Baldwin turned 15, and Raymond's regency came to an end. By now, the king was showing signs of his leprosy, especially in his face, hands, and feet. William of Tyre says that his subjects were distressed whenever they looked at him. One of Saladin's chroniclers, Imad Adin, made note of this, writing, The Franks were concerned to keep him in office, but they took no notice of his leprosy. The king's illness made the high court especially eager to contract a marriage for his sister, Sibylla. In 1176, the court arranged a match between Sibylla and William Longsword, Marquis of Montferrat. As cousin to both the Holy Roman Emperor and the King of France, Longsword was a politically excellent choice for Sibylla's one-day consort. However, within a year, William Longsword fell ill and died, leaving the 17-year-old Sibylla pregnant with his child. This only compounded the problem, for Longsword's death extinguished the idea that he might step in as the strong leader the kingdom required when Baldwin the leper eventually died. Sibylla's pregnancy meant that her next husband would have to accept that his own children would be unlikely to inherit the kingdom, and few of Christendom's great noblemen would be eager to enter into such an agreement. Meanwhile, Saif ad-Din of Mosul, another of Nur ad-Din's Zengid heirs, organized a new coalition against Saladin, including the emirs of Sinjar and Mardin. This obliged Saladin to bring his army again into Syria. Since he was at peace with the Crusaders, Saladin marched unopposed through Transjordan. He met Saif ad-Din of Mosul and his allies in battle at Tel al-Sultan near Aleppo in April 1176. The fighting was fierce, but Saladin emerged the victor and advanced on Aleppo. The ruler of Aleppo, Gumush Takim, struck an alliance with the crusader prince of Antioch, Bohemond III. As part of the peace, Gumush Takim released Frankish prisoners held in his dungeon, among them a Frankish lord who'd been imprisoned for some 15 years, Reynald of Châtillon, and Jocelyn III of Courtney, King Baldwin's uncle. Prior to his imprisonment, Reynold of Châtillon had been a force to be reckoned with, a fierce warlord who historian Bernard Hamilton describes as a controversial figure. Now, free at last, Reynold would once again assume a prominent position in the Crusader Kingdom and would play a key role in the reign of Baldwin IV. Saladin seemed poised to conquer Aleppo. He captured the castle of Azaz and closed the noose around the great Zengid city. However, abruptly, he called off his campaign 
and made a truce with the Zengids that included the restoration of Azars. What caused Saladin to pull back when he was so close to victory? In fact, it was events at Jerusalem that had snagged Saladin's attention. For, on July 15th, 1176, Baldwin the Leper officially attained his majority and acquired full powers as King of Jerusalem. One of the young king's first acts as an independent ruler was to refuse to renew Raymond of Tripoli's peace treaty with Saladin. A new era was beginning. Baldwin the Leper would not maintain the restrained policies of his regent. He wanted to take the fight to the enemy. Baldwin was about to make a bold move that would surprise even Saladin. To help execute his policy, Baldwin appointed as Seneschal his uncle, Jocelyn of Courtney, a competent, intelligent man who was absolutely loyal to the young king. Baldwin's new government immediately curbed Saladin's ambitions. The Sultan had to stop trying to conquer Aleppo and instead had to make peace with the Zengids. However, while marching back from Aleppo, Saladin attacked the assassin force of Masyaf. The Sultan was determined to destroy this mysterious order, for recently they'd made an attempt on his life. Chillingly, the attempt was made by Mamluks, thought to have been absolutely loyal to the Ayyubid dynasty. The Sultan was concerned that the assassins had infiltrated other ranks among his inner circle, and he perhaps thought the only way to eliminate the threat was to destroy them completely. On August the 1st, 1176, King Baldwin IV assembled the Jerusalem army, joined with Count Raymond's force from Tripoli, and raided Saladin's territory around the Bakar Valley. Saladin's nephew, Turan Shah, assembled an army and tried to interrupt the Frankish raid, but the young king defeated him soundly at the Battle of Baalbek. Saladin got word of this disaster and immediately abandoned his campaign against the assassins. Once more, the young Baldwin was interfering with his plans. These two summer campaigns, including a battlefield victory against the Ayyubids, amounted to Baldwin IV's first experiences at war. Surely the king relied on the knowledge of his veteran commanders, but it was an impressive debut for the teenage monarch. Baldwin refused to allow his disease to inhibit him, taking the field with his men and leading from the saddle, a sword in his grasp and an iron helmet on his head. Meanwhile, famine in Syria forced Saladin to retire with his army to Egypt. Baldwin took the opportunity to strike an alliance with the Byzantine Emperor. The agreement established Manuel as the overall protector of Eastern Christendom, making him overlord of the Crusader states. Saladin watched all these developments carefully. He constructed a navy and began to strengthen the defenses of his chief cities in Egypt. In the spring of 1177, King Baldwin made Reynold of Châtillon his fourth greatest vassal by granting him the hand of Stephanie of Milly, heiress to the frontier territories of Transjordan, including the great desert castle of Karak. From here, Reynold could harass Saladin's supply lines between Damascus and Egypt. Saladin's correspondence from this time is filled with complaints of his difficulties in transporting men and provisions between Syria and Egypt. Reynold was clearly a man trusted by Baldwin. Like Baldwin, Reynold understood that the key to reducing Ayyubid power was to disrupt Saladin's ability to secure both Egypt and Syria simultaneously. If Saladin were allowed to continue to expand his Syrian power, especially by capturing Aleppo, Jerusalem would come under grave threat. Thus, Reynold from his castle of Karak became a thorn in Saladin's side. William of Tyre disliked Reynold, but still described him as a man of proven loyalty and unusual steadfastness of character. Then, in August of 1177, Count Philip of Flanders, one of the most powerful men in Christendom, arrived with his army at Arca. Like many Westerners, Philip came as a crusader and as a pilgrim. He intended to visit the holy shrines and to join the Knights of the Crusader States in a campaign against the Muslims. 
the inhabitants of the Crusader Kingdom welcomed Philip's arrival. King Baldwin in particular viewed Philip's visit as a godsend. Recently, Baldwin's leprosy had grown worse. The Count of Flanders seemed like the solution to the king's trials. Baldwin offered the Count his very kingdom, requesting that Philip take on the burden of the crown and the defense of Jerusalem. Philip declined, announcing that his visit would be brief and that he must soon return to Flanders. Baldwin therefore asked that the Count join him in invading Saladin's power center of Egypt. Philip refused this as well, desiring instead to help Bohemond of Antioch on the Syrian front. Disappointed, King Baldwin nevertheless tried to bolster the Count's efforts and reinforced Philip's army with 100 knights and 2,000 infantry. It must have been difficult for the young leper king when the great Count of Flanders marched north. Count Philip joined Raymond III of Tripoli and Bohemond III of Antioch for an assault on the Syrian fortress of Harim. From Egypt, Saladin monitored all this. The Sultan understood that it was in his interest to eliminate this new power in Jerusalem as quickly as possible. In the autumn of 1177, with the bulk of the Crusader forces campaigning to the north in Syria, Saladin seized the opportunity. He assembled the full strength of his Egyptian forces. So large was the Sultan's army that its supply needs caused food prices to skyrocket in Egypt. The chronicler William of Tyre insists that Saladin fielded 26,000 cavalry. Today, some historians estimate Saladin's forces closer to 12 or 15,000. But even at such a size, the Muslim army was tremendous and capable of conquering the kingdom of Jerusalem. On November 18th, the Sultan crossed the Egyptian frontier into Christian territory. Knowing that Crusader forces were reduced, Saladin moved at a relaxed pace up the coast into Palestine, ravaging and burning farmland and collecting booty. Grandmaster Odo of saint Amon assembled the Knights Templar at their fortress of Gaza, but Saladin bypassed the Templar stronghold and drove for Ascalon, one of Jerusalem's key coastal cities. Meanwhile, King Baldwin gathered the few troops available to him. Joining the king were leading barons Baldwin of Ramla and Balian of Ibelin, as well as Reynaud of Châtillon. The Crusaders had with them their most precious relic, the true cross believed to be wood from the very cross of Jesus, carried by Bishop Alberts of Bethlehem. Altogether, the young king's cavalry was composed of only around 450 knights and a few thousand infantry. The Sultan approached Ascalon on November 24th. Baldwin knew himself to be dangerously outnumbered and so retired behind the city's walls. Now fully confident that Baldwin could not challenge him, Saladin dispatched raiding parties inside the countryside. Some Muslim contingents reached the very walls of Jerusalem itself. News of the Sultan's marauding troops spread fear throughout the kingdom. In Jerusalem, the citizens hid in the Tower of David while the inhabitants of Ramla abandoned their city to take refuge in the fortified port of Jaffa or at the castle of Mirabel. However, King Baldwin was determined to resist Saladin. He dispatched a message summoning the Templars from Gaza. Soon, Grandmaster Odo of saint Amon rode up before Ascalon with around 80 Templar knights. Bolstered by the Templars, King Baldwin led his army out of Ascalon to seek battle. They marched up the coast to Ibelin and then swung inland. On November 25th, King Baldwin and his knights advanced on the enemy. Saladin was surprised to learn that the Christians were approaching. The Sultan was in the middle of moving his army across a ravine near the castle of Mongizar, a few miles southeast of Ramla. At once, Saladin ordered the beating of war drums, the signal for his troops to reassemble. The Muslim troops scrambled to array themselves for battle. Arab chronicler Ibn al-Athir records the scene. The next thing they knew, the Franks were upon them with their battalions and their champions. Saladin only had a part of his army, since many of his men had dispersed in search of booty. When he saw the Franks, he stood firm with the men he had. 
Although King Baldwin had effectively achieved surprise, Saladin had time to get a good portion of his army into position. Ibn Shaddad, one of Saladin's closest servants and his biographer, tells us that the Sultan himself later explained the situation to him. The Muslims had drawn up for battle, and when the enemy approached, some of our men decided that the right wing should cross to the left, and the left cross toward the center, in order that when battle was joined, they might have at their backs a hill known as Ramla land. While they were occupied in this maneuver, the Franks charged them. William of Tyre also indicates that Saladin managed to achieve some level of battle readiness. He writes, The enemy's forces, who had ventured some distance away to seek booty, began to arrive from different directions, a circumstance which greatly increased Saladin's strength. William of Tyre next describes the start of the clash. The ranks of fighters on both sides now gradually approached each other, and a battle ensued, which was at first indecisive, but the forces were very unequal. The Christians, however, strengthened by the grace shed upon them from on high, soon began to press on with ever-increasing boldness. Saladin's lines were broken, and, after a terrible slaughter, forced to flee. As both William and Ibn Shaddad point out, it was the charge of the Christian cavalry that shattered Saladin's lines. A pilgrim present for the battle later recounted to the Dean of London the attack led by the Grand Master of the Templars, Odo of saint Armand. He took himself into battle with his men, strengthened by the sign of the cross. Spurring all together as one man, they made a charge, turning neither to the left nor to the right. Recognizing the battalion from which Saladin commanded, they manfully approached it, immediately penetrated it, incessantly knocked down, scattered, struck and crushed. Saladin's Mamluk bodyguards, wearing yellow silk over their breastplates, were slain almost to a man. The Sultan himself was nearly killed by the charge of the Templars, but he managed to mount a racing camel and rush away to safety with only a few companions. The Battle of Montgizad was a great triumph for King Baldwin IV. The Crusaders chased down the fleeing enemy, slaying them all the way to a nearby marsh. The pursuit lasted into the night. Crusaders hunted down the remnants of Saladin's army for miles. William of Tyre writes that, The king went back to Ascalon, where he awaited the return of his forces who had pursued the fugitives by different roads. Within four days, they had all arrived, loaded with plunder, carrying tents and driving before them slaves, troops of camels and horses. They came, according to the words of the prophet, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. In their rush for safety, the Muslim survivors abandoned booty, prisoners and weapons. Saladin's own journey across the Sinai Desert was perilous with Bedouin harassing him and his almost defenseless companions. The flight was particularly difficult as violent storms raged for 10 days, causing many fugitives to get lost, only to be captured by crusaders a few days later. William of Tyre recalls, Many in their ignorance of the localities and thinking that they were on the way home presented themselves in our villages either to travelers or to those who were hunting them. On reaching the Egyptian frontier, Saladin dispatched messengers on camels to Cairo, assuring any would-be rebels that he was alive. Once at Cairo, he used carrier pigeons to proclaim his survival throughout Egypt. Nevertheless, the defeat was extremely humiliating for the Sultan, and his prestige was damaged in the eyes of both his subjects and his enemies. King Baldwin and his men had achieved a great victory. Saladin's casualties were immense, with only about 10% of his forces managing to escape. As a result, the Kingdom of Jerusalem was saved. That a small army of Crusaders and Templars, led by a 16-year-old leper, achieved all this is truly remarkable. But Baldwin knew that there would be more challenges in the future from Saladin, the Sultan had lost his army, but his immense resources in Egypt and Damascus would allow him to rebuild quickly. 
To prepare, the king began in October of 1178 to build a new castle at Jacob's Ford in the Jordan River between Lake Hule and the Sea of Galilee. In this project, Baldwin collaborated with the Knights Templar, who already held an important castle at Safar, and were often charged with guarding vulnerable frontier positions. For some time, Jacob's Ford had been left unfortified, but with Saladin in control of Damascus and the Crusaders unable to recover Banias, Baldwin believed that the site had to be protected. A castle in this position would hinder an invasion of Galilee and provide a base for raiding into Hauran. By the spring of 1179, the inner wall had been raised, but the outer wall still needed to be finished. The planned fortress would be one of the strongest in the region. The labor took place while Saladin was besieging the rebel emir Ibn al-Muqadam at Baalbek. But the sultan was watching the project with concern. For him, the castle was an intolerable threat to his territory. He offered King Baldwin 60,000 dinars to destroy the structure, and then 100,000. Baldwin refused both proposals. Saladin put this money instead toward a military solution, dispatching raiding parties to harass the territory around Jacob's Ford. In May 1179, the Sultan launched a force to test the castle's defenses. But the real showdown came on June 10th, when Saladin's army confronted a Frankish force at the Battle of Marj Ayun. The battle took place between the Leontes River and the Upper Jordan, northwest of Barnias. Saladin opened the campaign by situating his army at Barnias. From here, he dispatched raiding parties to burn the villages to the east of Sidon. King Baldwin assembled his army and marched to relieve the threatened district. The Christians set out from Tiberias toward the Templar castle of Safad to Toron and then to the eastern flank of the coastal plain overlooking Marj Ayun. From here, the Crusaders could see the tents of the Sultan's main army. The king, along with his commanders, decided to launch an immediate attack, hoping to catch the Muslims off guard. The Christian cavalry advanced ahead of their infantry, hoping to launch a decisive charge. Initially, this is exactly what happened. Baldwin's army caught Saladin's detachments as they returned from raiding the villages. Unprepared, the Muslim horsemen were quickly defeated and fled. The Franks now moved to wrap up the campaign. Part of the Christian army advanced on the Sultan's camp, while Raymond of Tripoli and the Templars occupied the high ground between Marj Ayun and the Litani Gorge. The infantry gathered spoil and rested. However, Saladin then executed a clever surprise assault. Quickly reassembling his main force, the Sultan advanced rapidly on his enemies. The Crusaders were caught unprepared and badly defeated. The Templars were at the forefront of the fighting, and many of them were captured or slain, including their Grand Master, Odo of saint Armand. King Baldwin himself barely escaped with his life. His illness rendered him unable to mount his horse, and he had to be carried to safety by his knights. Many of the Crusaders took refuge at the castle of Beaufort. Nevertheless, Christian losses were considerable. It was a spectacular victory for Saladin and a serious reverse for the leper king. The Sultan was able to replenish his coffers by ransoming his Frankish prisoners for sacks of gold. But when Saladin offered a ransom deal to the Templar Grand Master, Odo answered gruffly, a Templar's only ransom is his dagger. Saladin sent the defiant Templar to end his days in a Damascus prison. On August 24th, Saladin launched an all-out assault on the castle at Jacob's Ford. Within five days, he'd taken it. His men slaughtered many of those they found inside, whether combatants or non-combatants. The survivors, they sent to the slave markets. When it was all over, a smouldering ruin lay at the site of King Baldwin's splendid castle. Saladin had inflicted a major reverse on the kingdom's defenses. However, the Muslim army suffered from an outbreak of plague, which killed many of Saladin's troops, including 10 of his chief emirs. 
Still, the campaign was a clear success for the Sultan. He followed it up by raiding the farmlands around Tiberias, Tyre, and Beirut to spread terror and a sense of insecurity throughout the kingdom. Baldwin IV showed incredible resolve throughout this difficult period, but the campaigning of 1179 took a hard toll on his health. While fighting alongside his men in the muddy, rugged terrain along the Jordan, the king's condition deteriorated, and by the end of the year, his leprosy had greatly advanced. Baldwin felt himself near death and took steps to secure his kingdom, even as his great enemy Saladin grew ever more powerful. The destruction of the castle at Jacob's Ford was a damaging blow, but at the start of 1180, King Baldwin IV's health was of greater concern. The king's leprosy had advanced, his disabilities multiplied. Only 19, he felt death approaching and wanted to secure the future of his kingdom. To do this, Baldwin sought a suitable husband for his sister and heir, Princess Sibylla. So far, he'd been unsuccessful, even after propositioning many leading noblemen in France. However, Sibylla herself was fond of a young Poitavon knight already at court, Guy of Lusignan. Guy was not without connections. His older brother, Emery, the future constable of Jerusalem, was a close ally of King Baldwin's mother, Agnes. Agnes suggested Guy as a match for the princess. Years of negotiations with the leading noble houses of France had produced no husband, but Guy was already in Jerusalem and came from a proud lineage of committed crusaders. He was young, healthy, and a gallant knight. And what's more, Sibylla was already taken with him. Baldwin trusted his mother and took her advice. William of Tyre disapproved of the marriage. He writes, But without wanting to consider that too much haste spoils everything, the king, for reasons of his own, suddenly married his sister to a young man of fairly good rank, Guy of Lusignan son of Hugh the Brown from the Diocese of Portier. Baldwin's decision to marry his sister to Guy surprised many members of the high court. However, it was particularly difficult to find a match for Sibylla, given that she already had a son, three-year-old Prince Baldwin, who was next in line for the throne. Anyone marrying Sibylla had to accept that his own children would be unlikely to inherit the kingdom. But this was no hasty decision on Baldwin's part. The leper king had reliable information that Raymond III of Tripoli and Bohemond III of Antioch were conspiring to seize power in Jerusalem. By this, Raymond and Bohemond planned to wed Sibylla to a husband of their own choice. In addition, Guy's father was a vassal to Henry II, the Angevin king of England. Baldwin himself was descended from the Angevins, and King Henry was fast becoming the most powerful ruler in the West. By selecting a husband for Sibylla from the Angevin camp, Baldwin hoped to increase Henry II's investment in the Crusader kingdom. The popular idea today that Sibylla was a silly girl in love, Guy a blundering newcomer, and Baldwin an ailing king fooled by his manipulative mother does not stand up to historical scrutiny. Baldwin's decision shows careful consideration. His sister Sibylla had been educated to rule, and Guy's brother Amalric had been an effective and useful servant of the crown. Nevertheless, Baldwin would eventually regret his choice for a brother-in-law. Prior to 1180, no serious divisions existed within the kingdom. However, the conspiracy of Raymond and Bohemond followed by the wedding of Sibylla and Guy, solidified a fault line running through the kingdom's ruling elite. On the one side was King Baldwin, his mother, his uncle Jocelyn, Sibylla and Guy, and Raynor of Châtillon, essentially a faction of the king's maternal family. On the other side were Bohemond III, Raymond III, the Ibeline family and the dowager queen Maria Comnena, representing the king's paternal kin. King Baldwin was keenly aware of this division, and knew that it threatened the very existence of his kingdom. He was committed to remaining in office until this division could be healed. 
In the late spring of 1180, King Baldwin sought a two-year truce with Saladin. Saladin was happy to oblige, for the Seljuk Turks, led by Sultan Kilij Arslan II, were growing in power and Saladin wanted to check that power. Saladin was also anxious to avoid attracting the intervention of the Byzantine Emperor Manuel. Meanwhile, Baldwin worked to stabilize the situation within his kingdom. To prevent his rivals from advancing, his younger sister Isabella, as an alternative heir to Sibylla and Guy, the king betrothed Isabella to Humphrey IV of Turon, 15-year-old son of the late constable, in October of 1180. The marriage could not take place until Isabella turned 12, and so the little princess was sent to live at the frontier fortress of Kerak with her future mother-in-law, Stephanie of Milly, wife of Reynault of Châtillon. Here, Isabella would be securely within the power of the king's faction. It was also around this time that the new Grand Master of the Templars reached Jerusalem. He was Arnold of Toroja, a Catalan veteran of the Crusades in Spain. Arnold had been the nominee of Pope Alexander III, who was concerned about the Holy Land and wanted an independent but experienced man in charge of the Templars. Also around this time, the Byzantine Emperor Manuel died. William of Tyre writes, Manuel, the illustrious emperor of Constantinople, of immortal memory, the most munificent of all the princes of the land, laid aside the burden of the flesh and rendered his soul to heaven. His memory will ever be held in benediction by all the assembly of the saints because of his alms and liberal benefactions. Baldwin continued to work to strengthen his kingdom. Throughout 1181, he associated Sibylla and Guy with himself in royal edicts, enforcing their status as heirs to the throne. Meanwhile, as the truce with Saladin drew to a close, the High Court sought to heal the divisions between King Baldwin and Count Raymond III. The king agreed to this if Raymond would be reconciled to Guy of Lusignan. The count gave his assent to these terms, and Guy and Raymond began to take their place together at the meetings of the High Court. The dangerous factionalism seemed healed, while Baldwin, despite his disease, continued to govern the kingdom very effectively. However, Guy of Lusignan remained unpopular with many of the kingdom's high-ranking nobles. The truce with Saladin would end in May 1182. For the past two years, Saladin had mostly devoted himself to curbing the Seljuk Turks, as well as building up the strength of his navy, which now contained some 30 to 40 war galleys. In November of 1181, As-Salih, the Zengid prince of Aleppo, fell ill. Before he died in December, he designated as his heir his cousin, Is Adin of Mosul, hoping that the combined powers of Aleppo and Mosul would prevent Saladin from further eroding Zengid territory. Ibn al-Athir records the death of the prince. When he had given up all hope, he summoned the emirs and all the troops and enjoined them to deliver Aleppo to his cousin, Es al-Din, and made them swear to that. He said, you are aware that Saladin has taken the whole of Syria except for what I hold. If Saladin conquers Aleppo, there will be no place left for our family to resist him. But if I give the city to Az al -Din, he will be able to hold on to it with his large armies and lands. Hearing that Az Salih was near death, Saladin, who was in Egypt at the time, commanded his nephew Farouk Shah, the governor of Damascus, to march out with his army and prevent Is ad din from assuming power in Aleppo. However, Reynaud of Châtillon was also watching developments in Aleppo with interest. To frustrate Saladin's plans, Reynaud led a raid from Transjordan into the Arabian desert, pillaging the land and plundering caravans. Farouk Shah had no choice but to lead his troops against Reynaud, who withdrew before the advancing Damascus army. Ibn al-Athir recorded his impression of these events. 
Prince Reynald, Lord of Kirak, one of the most devilish Franks and the most hostile to the Moslems, had prepared for a campaign, gathered his troops and all he could assemble, and determined to march over land to Tarek, and from there to Medina, the city of the Prophet. Allah bless him and give him peace to gain control of those august regions. Reynold's raid prevented Farouk Shah from carrying out Saladin's orders to occupy Aleppo, allowing Iz ad-Din of Mosul to march into Aleppo and assume his position as ruler without incident. Undeniably, this was a major setback for Saladin, who lost the opportunity to gain his most desired prize in Syria. Reynold's raids spread terror on the pilgrim roads between Mecca and Damascus and allowed the Lord of Kerak to intercept Saladin's communications from Egypt. Ibn al-Athir was surely wrong that Reynold intended to conquer these regions. Such a conquest would have been well beyond the resources of the frontier lord, and Reynold took with him only a small cavalry force. Rather, Reynold's raid was meant to have a psychological impact. Reynold wanted to show that Saladin could not protect the pilgrim roads, and he also wanted to undermine the Sultan's assertion that he was the champion of Islam. This was doubly embarrassing for Saladin, since he was in the midst of a long-running war to destroy one of Syria's great Muslim powers, the Zengids, the family of Nur ad-Din, who had been an undeniable champion in the fight against the Crusaders. Reynold's activities reveal his understanding of the political situation in Muslim Syria. He meant to undermine Saladin's power by discrediting him among his fellow Muslims. However, Reynold's raid had taken place while the truce between Saladin and the Kingdom of Jerusalem was still in force. Of course, Saladin himself had been in the process of interfering with the legal transference of power from one Zengid prince to another, and the preservation of Zengid rule in Aleppo was vital to the interests of the Crusader states. Reynold claimed that Saladin himself was breaking the truce. He accused the Sultan of moving troops and weapons up from Egypt. Saladin complained to King Baldwin about Reynold's raid. Baldwin acknowledged the breach of the truce. This has often been viewed as evidence that Reynold was acting as a renegade lord, but recently historians like Bernard Hamilton have re-evaluated the situation, insisting that Reynold could not have acted as he did without Baldwin's approval. Indeed, Reynold's raid was in line with Baldwin's own policy of preventing Saladin from gaining control of Aleppo. Bernard Hamilton writes, In fact, Saladin himself did not wish to renew the truce. In the spring of 1182, while it was still in force, a Christian vessel from Apulia was wrecked near Damietta, and he seized the cargo and imprisoned the 1,676 passengers. Both sides recognized that the truce could only be temporary. Saladin had long made it clear that he intended to eventually destroy the Crusader Kingdom. Indeed, he argued to the Abbasid Caliph that the justification for his campaigns against the Zengids was to unite Islam under his banner for the final war to eliminate the Crusaders. Saladin decided to return to Damascus to secure his communications with Egypt and to launch a campaign against Jerusalem. On May 11th, the Sultan departed Cairo with his army. In response, Baldwin gathered his military at Jerusalem. Reynold argued that the Christian army should march into Kerak to block Saladin's advance. King Baldwin agreed. As the leper king led his forces into Transjordan, Saladin raided the territory around the frontier fortress of Montréal. Then the Sultan marched on Kerak. Here, the Christian army guarded the cornfields and refused to give battle. Saladin decided that he too preferred not to risk battle and withdrew to his castle of Al-Azhar in the Syrian desert. By June 22nd, Saladin was back in Damascus. Here, he received important news from Constantinople. A Byzantine nobleman called Andronicus Komnenus had led a revolt in the capital which resulted in the mass slaying of the city's Frankish inhabitants. The riot in Constantinople had been so brutal that the hospital of St. John was sacked and the sick inhabitants murdered. 
Andronicus then murdered the remaining members of the royal family who still held sympathy for the Crusader states, including Emperor Manuel's widow, Maria, who was herself Frankish. Andronicus now adopted a policy that was strictly hostile to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. William of Tyre writes, This Andronicus, a cousin of the late emperor, was a false and wicked man, ever disloyal to the empire and ever active in sowing the seeds of rebellion. Saladin could now launch a full invasion of the Crusader Kingdom without any fear that the Byzantines would intervene. On July 13th, 1182, the Sultan sent a force to besiege the Frankish castle of Bethsan in southern Galilee. The Arab chronicler Ibn al-Athir describes the action. After Saladin had come to Damascus, he remained for some days to rest and repose, he and his troops. Then he marched into Frankish territory and made for Tiberias, in the vicinity of which he camped. He pitched his tents at Okhwana on the Jordan. The Franks arrived with their detachments and stopped at Tiberias. Saladin sent Farouk Shah, his nephew, to Bethsan, which he entered by force of arms and plundered thoroughly, killing and enslaving. He swept through the Jordan depression with a far-reaching raid, which spread death and captivity over the inhabitants. Baldwin assembled the Christian army at Safaria and marched to the relief of Bethsan. The Crusaders encountered Saladin's host near Le Forbelet in southeastern Galilee on July 15th, the eighth anniversary of Baldwin's coronation. William of Tyre writes, Here they beheld Saladin's forces stretching out all around in numbers far greater than they had ever before experienced. In fact, the older commanders declared that at no time since the Latins first entered Syria had they beheld such a mighty array of foes. It was the height of summer and the heat was intense. King Baldwin, though quite ill, commanded from the saddle. The two armies clashed and the fighting was fierce. The Crusaders were outnumbered with only about 700 heavy cavalry. William of Tyre says that, In that battle, only a few of our knights fell about to be received in the company of the saints above, but of the infantry many perished. The loss of the enemy was far greater. Some of their principal leaders also fell, a catastrophe which caused the enemy to desert the field of battle in consternation. Saladin was defeated and withdrew across the Jordan. For Baldwin, the Battle of Le Forbelet was not nearly so spectacular a victory as Montguizard, but once again, Saladin's attempt to destroy the kingdom had been thwarted, and once again, Baldwin's resilience had been crucial. Baldwin's leadership was a critical unifying force, especially as tensions still simmered between Raymond III and Guy of Lusignan. Saladin wasn't done yet. After his defeat at Fort Belay, he organized a joint attack on Beirut, the weakest of the Crusader port cities. Ibn al-Athir recounts the event. From Damascus, Saladin went to Beirut and ravaged its locality. He had ordered the Egyptian fleet to sail to Beirut. They came and blockaded it, attacking it and its region. Saladin came and linked up with them, plundering what the fleet had not got to. He besieged Beirut for a number of days, intending to persist until he took it. Meanwhile, a detachment from Egypt, led by Saladin's brother, Al-Adil, struck the Christian kingdom's southern lands, raiding the territory around Gaza and Ascalon. News of this new threat was brought to King Baldwin IV, who kept his cool. He recognized that the Sultan was tempting him to divide his army. Baldwin decided to protect Beirut, while he did not intervene in the south, since the Sultan's Egyptian raiding parties couldn't accomplish much in that region. Baldwin established Tyre as his army's base of operations. The ports of Arca and Tyre were filled with Italian refugees from the massacre of the Latins in Constantinople earlier in the year, and Baldwin recruited many Italian ships to join in the fight. Meanwhile, the garrison within Beirut fought courageously. When Baldwin sent word that he was on the way with his army, Saladin stopped the siege and withdrew. 
Saladin had failed to take Beirut, but his attack had inflicted serious damage to the economic resources of the Crusader Kingdom. The Sultan moved to the north of Syria at the end of the summer to campaign against the Zengids. However, the Crusaders were alarmed because Saladin did not bother to make a truce with them. This owed to the changed situation in Constantinople. Without Byzantine help, the Franks could not hope to launch a major invasion of Egypt, and Saladin knew this. In September, Saladin crossed the Euphrates into Zengid territory. He conquered Haran, Edessa, Raqqa, and Nisbin. By November 10th, he was encamped outside Mosul. That summer, the Zengids had struck an alliance with King Baldwin IV, and on behalf of his Muslim allies, the leper king marched to raid Saladin's lands around Damascus. He was accompanied by Count Raymond III, an indication of the increasing harmony in the Crusader camp. Saladin's local garrisons couldn't resist, and the Franks were able to burn the farmlands and villages at will. As in the previous year, Frankish policy was to prevent Saladin from extending his power in the north of Syria. By December, Saladin was still besieging Mosul, and the king and Count Raymond led joint raids into Saladin's lands. Raymond attacked territory around Bosra, and Baldwin pillaged near Damascus. Neither raid amounted to a major expedition, but kept the pressure on Saladin, while he was away, invested so heavily against Mosul. Also, the raids provided intelligence. The Crusaders were able to confirm that no fresh Ayyubid forces had been brought up to Damascus since September. All of this makes sense in light of actions that Raynal of Châtillon was about to take, which would go down as one of the most audacious moves made during the long war between Saladin and the Leper King. From the start of his rule, Baldwin IV worked to prevent his neighbor and enemy, the Sultan Saladin, from conquering Jerusalem and from extending his power in northern Syria. At the start of 1183, Baldwin had been successful in this. Despite Saladin's immense resources, the Sultan had been unable to conquer the Crusader Kingdom and had failed to take control of the most important cities of his chief Muslim rivals, the Zengids. Now, Saladin was once again trying to break the power of the Zengids in Aleppo and Mosul. Baldwin had forged an alliance with the Muslim Zengid dynasty and was cooperating with them in curbing Saladin's ambitions. Over the winter of 1182, Saladin subdued many fortresses between Mosul and Aleppo, effectively dividing the two great Zengid cities. Meanwhile, one of Baldwin's vassals, Reynald of Châtillon, made a bold move to disrupt Saladin's policy. At his desert castle of Karak, Reynald's men built a fleet of five warships in sections. This was an expensive undertaking involving skilled shipwrights from the coastal cities. King Baldwin surely knew about this project and must have helped fund it. Reynald's forces transported the ships on the backs of camels across the desert to the Gulf of Aqaba. Here, the ships were assembled and launched onto the Red Sea, where no Christian ship had ventured since the Muslim conquest of Egypt five centuries earlier. The Red Sea was famously dangerous, and Reynald employed Arab pilots who knew the waters well. Each galley contained groups of fighting men. There were no Muslim warships in the area, and the coastal cities were unwalled. This was a region that Saladin never imagined could be attacked, and that was exactly why Reynald selected it. Two of Reynald's ships blockaded the castle of Pharaoh's Island in the Gulf of Aqaba. Reynald himself did not join in the naval campaign, but blockaded the port of Ailat with his land forces. The other three warships cruised into the Red Sea and ravaged more than a dozen Muslim merchant ships. They then sacked Adhab, crowded with pilgrims bound for Mecca. Finally, they struck inland and captured a caravan, slaughtering all of its members. The fleet then crossed the Red Sea and continued its reign of terror. At Mecca, people panicked, for the pirates seemed headed for Mecca itself. Saladin's regime handled the situation effectively. The Sultan's brother, Al-Adil, dispatched Egyptian warships onto the Red Sea. Reynald withdrew with the land forces back to Transjordan, while some crew members of the Christian ships fled and made their escape. The Ayyubids managed to destroy Reynald's ships and capture many of his troops. Saladin ordered all of these prisoners paraded through the cities of Egypt and then decapitated. 
Historian Andrew Ehrenkreutz writes that Saladin's rapid defeat of Reynald's campaign did as much as any other single event to increase Saladin's reputation as the defender of Islam against the infidels. However, not everyone in the Muslim world felt this way. For some, Saladin's own long-running war with the Zengids was to blame for allowing this shocking raid to occur at all. Throughout this period, Saladin remained in Zengid territory, campaigning against Mosul's ruler, Iz Adin. Saladin was hoping to gain the approval of the Abbasid Caliph in his war against the Zengids. But the Caliph An Nasir sent a messenger to Mosul, asking Saladin to stop his attacks on the city. Saladin broke off his invasion in February of 1183. For the time being, Aleppo and Mosul remained out of Saladin's reach. Historian Bernard Hamilton states that Reynald had shown that the Ayyubids could not protect the Hajj because of Saladin's political ambitions in northern Syria and Iraq. In some circles of the Muslim world, this injured the Sultan's public image. For years, the Zengids themselves had been complaining that Saladin was waging an unjust war against their rightful rule in the north of Syria and Iraq. The events of 1182 had greatly strained the resources of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. When the king gathered the high court in February of 1183, it was agreed that a general tax would be leveled to bolster the kingdom's defenses. Meanwhile, the chronicler William of Tyre reports that the king's leprosy was worse than ever. The king lost his sight, and the extremities of his body became completely diseased and damaged, so that he was unable to use his hands and feet. Yet, although some people suggested to him that he should abdicate and lead a retired life, he refused to surrender either the royal office or the government of the kingdom. For although his body was weak and powerless, he was strong in spirit and made a superhuman effort to disguise his illness and shoulder the burdens of kingship. In May, Saladin resumed his campaign against the Zengids. His recent conquests had cut Aleppo off from Mosul, and so the Sultan was able to fully blockade Aleppo. Is Adin of Mosul's brother, Imad Adin, who governed Aleppo on behalf of the Zengids, was left with little option but to sit and watch his city starve. Instead, he struck a deal with Saladin, surrendering in exchange for the fife of Sinjar. Ibn al-Athir records Zengid disappointment. Imad Adin gave up a fortress like Aleppo and received in exchange some villages and fields. He left and Saladin took it over. Everyone was amazed at this and condemned what he had done. Indeed, some of the common people of Aleppo brought a tub of water and shouted out, You are not fit to rule. You are only fit to wash clothes. On June 12, 1183, Saladin's forces took control of Aleppo. Finally, the Sultan had broken this great Zengid stronghold. It was a moment of profound triumph, expanding Saladin's already powerful empire. As the Sultan rode into Aleppo, it must have been a moment of sheer exhilaration. News of Saladin's conquest of Aleppo fell upon the Kingdom of Jerusalem like a black cloud. But Baldwin and his subjects had little time to dwell on the matter, for they soon learned that Saladin, fresh from his triumph, was once again assembling his army for another invasion of the Crusader Kingdom. The king summoned the army to Sepphoris. Raymond III of Tripoli and Bowman III of Antioch both sent knights, and tax funds paid for mercenaries to increase the ranks. The total Frankish army came to about 1,300 cavalry and 15,000 infantry, but King Baldwin felt so ill he could not join the army. His mother attended him at Nazareth, and he lay feverish in bed. Everyone believed he would soon die. With Saladin stronger than ever, now approaching with his army, it was an ominous situation. King Baldwin chose a regent to rule for him. William of Tyre records, the king appointed Guy of Lusignan, regent of the kingdom, ordering all his liegemen and all the princes in general that they should become his vassals and do him homage. And this was done, but first, by the king's command, Guy was made to swear that during Baldwin's lifetime he would never seek to make himself king, and that he would neither give to anyone else nor alienate from the royal treasury any of the citizened castles which the king at present possessed. 
William of Tyre claims that these conditions were imposed because there were rumors that Guy had promised portions of the royal domain to his supporters. William held a low opinion of Guy, writing, He was unequal in strength and wisdom to the great burden he had taken upon himself. Guy of Lusignan was now commander-in-chief of the army. It was imperative that he rise to the challenge of Saladin's invasion. Success in the field would silence his critics and strengthen his position as Baldwin's successor. But Guy lacked experience. So far, he'd not even led a large-scale raid. On September 17, 1183, Saladin's army massed just south of Damascus in preparation to invade the Christian kingdom. Saladin crossed the Jordan River on September 29 and marched to Bethsan, the inhabitants of which fled to Tiberias. Meanwhile, the Frankish army drew toward Lafeve. Saladin's army was considerably larger than the Crusader force. The Sultan dispatched an advanced cavalry of some 500 to harass the marching Crusaders. The Franks maintained impeccable order, the cavalry marching in the center, screened by armored infantry with large shields. The Sultan's advance force failed to goad the Christians into an early charge. As the Crusaders drew towards Saladin's host, a minor skirmish broke out between Ayubid horsemen and Amri of Lusignan's knights. Amri received support from the Ibelin brothers, Baldwin and Balian, and together they drove back Saladin's cavalry. For nine days, such skirmishes broke out between the two sides. At times, the fighting turned fierce, and there were casualties in both camps. The Sultan dispatched parties of horsemen to pillage around Forbelay. Saladin tried to provoke the Christians into battle, but they held a firm and defensible position. On October 7, the Sultan marched to Mount Tabor, again trying to tempt the Crusaders into following. But they refused. Low on supplies, Saladin decided to retreat. He crossed the Jordan and was back in Damascus by October 14. The Franks now returned to Sepphoris, where they remained mustered for some days, concerned that the Sultan might return for another attack. Strategically, the Crusader army had performed quite well. Saladin's enormous army had invaded Galilee, but achieved little, pushed back by a cohesive Frankish army that sustained no significant losses. Defying all expectations, King Baldwin recovered from his fever. He was not happy with the outcome of Guy's clash with Saladin. William of Tyre states that the king believed Guy had handled the campaign incompetently. Baldwin dissolved Guy's power as regent, resuming full power himself. Baldwin seems to have believed that Guy had lost a key opportunity to inflict a decisive defeat on Saladin. This was no mere border skirmish. The kingdom's army was fully mustered at great expense and was well positioned to engage the Sultan's host head on. Many of the leading nobles felt that Saladin had been reckless and, as at Montgissard, had left himself open to disaster. Perhaps if a decisive attack had been attempted, Saladin's army could have been annihilated. Not everyone agreed. Some members of the high court felt that Saladin was too well positioned and that attacking him would have led to disaster. But the king was one of those that felt otherwise. Baldwin lost all trust in Guy for failing to attack Saladin. This is striking, given the popular image created by the film Kingdom of Heaven, which depicts the opposite. Baldwin worried that Guy might start a war with the Muslims. To solidify his new policy, Baldwin had his five-year-old nephew, son of Sibylla, crowned alongside him in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on November 20, 1183, as King Baldwin V of Jerusalem. In this, Baldwin was widely supported by the High Court, with Bowman III, Raymond III, and Baldwin and Balian of Ibelin all agreeing with the decision. Baldwin now took steps to isolate Guy, with the likely goal of driving him from the kingdom. The leper king asked the Patriarch of Jerusalem to review the marriage between Sibylla and Guy, and to hopefully have it annulled. But more pressing matters arose. Saladin again assembled his army and launched another invasion this time targeting the frontier fortress of Kerak. Baldwin recognized the enormity of this threat. Now blind and lame, the king still led his men. Unable to ride, he was carried on a litter at the head of his marching troops. Saladin wanted Kerak. The castle had been a thorn in his side since he'd captured Damascus, but Kerak was no easy conquest. The castle was enormous and incorporated the most sophisticated features of Frankish fortification. Even today, the ruins of Kerak present an imposing sight. 
Saladin gathered a large Syrian army to attack the castle. Ibn al-Athir recounts the campaign. Saladin came to Kirak during Rajab, where he was joined by his brother Al-Adil with the Egyptian army. His combined army was numerous, and he imposed a tight blockade. The Muslims got into the suburb and took control of it, pressing the siege of the fortress from the suburb and gaining the upper hand in the battle. Seven trebuchets were set up which continued to hurl stones night and day. The Christian army advanced toward Karak, the relic of the true cross of Christ carried before them. By the time they reached the Dead Sea, King Baldwin was seriously ill and gave command to Raymond III of Tripoli. On December 4, Saladin learned of the approach of the Crusader army and, after a month-long siege, decided to retreat. Guy had been with the Relief Army, but as soon as the Karak campaign ended, he fled to Ascalon, sending a message for Sibylla to join him. Guy feared that once Baldwin returned to Jerusalem, he would never permit Sibylla to see him again. Sibylla faithfully joined her husband at Ashkelon. The king summoned Guy to a personal meeting. Guy refused, claiming illness, which must have struck Baldwin as rich. King Baldwin traveled to Ashkelon, demanding entry. Guy refused to open the gate. Baldwin had himself carried on his litter to the gate and personally knocked on the door. The purpose of this gesture, which was witnessed by many of the townspeople standing on the wall, was to highlight Guy's disobedience and justify the king in divesting Guy of his fife. Baldwin now traveled to Jaffa, where the garrison opened the gate to him without question. The king dismissed Guy's garrison and appointed his own governor. Baldwin next traveled to Acre and assembled the high court. Here, he formally motioned for Guy to be dispossessed as a recalitrant vassal. In June of 1184, Baldwin sent the masters of the temple and the hospital, along with the Patriarch Heraclius of Jerusalem, on a mission to the west to seek the help of a new crusade against Saladin. In particular, the mission was to focus on King Henry II of England, Baldwin's relative. Baldwin hoped to prompt a sense of duty in the powerful English king, who was enormously wealthy and ruled half of France. Henry had already contributed much financially to the kingdom of Jerusalem, but Baldwin wanted his royal cousin to come himself to the relief of the Holy Land. By August, Saladin was again besieging Karak. Baldwin was unable to rise from his bed, but still he led the army, carried on a litter for the whole of the grueling march. Defended by Reynald of Châtillon, Karak held strong. The chronicler Ibn al-Athir records the siege and subsequent events. The Franks set out by night for Kirak, and when Saladin learned of that, he realized that he was not going to gain the upper hand on this occasion, nor attain any objective. He proceeded to Nablus and plundered all the land on his route. Having arrived at Nablus, he set fire to it, destroyed and sacked it. He killed, captured, and enslaved many there. Saladin withdrew to Damascus. The leper king oversaw the restoration of Kerak's moat and granted Reynald of Châtillon a large subsidy to repair the damaged outer wall. At this time, Guy still stubbornly held to Ashkelon. Despite his unpopularity, he had some supporters in the high court arguing on his behalf and trying to prevent the king from fully divesting him from his fife. Then, on October 6, 1184, Guy of Lusignan launched a raid from Ashkelon, attacking Bedouin near the royal fife of Darum on the edge of the Sinai Desert. These Bedouin were under the kingdom's protection, and the raid was a vengeful act in response to Baldwin's moves to have Guy divested from his fife. The king was furious. The Bedouin were strong allies of the kingdom, who spied on Saladin and provided crucial intelligence to the Crusaders. The stupidity of Guy's raid only served to highlight his unfitness for the throne. As 1184 drew to a close, Baldwin's health declined rapidly. By early 1185, it was clear that he was dying. The high court assembled around his bed while the king dictated his final will. The chronicler Ernoul describes the scene. The members of the high court said, We do not wish that when the child has been crowned, that his stepfather, Guy of Lusignan, should be regent, because we know that he would have neither the knowledge nor the ability to govern the kingdom. Then the king said, 
decide among yourselves whom I should appoint as regent for the child. They decided that nobody could rule as well as the Count of Tripoli, so the king sent for the Count and asked him to act as regent of the kingdom and of the child king for ten years until the child came of age. In his presence, Baldwin had the high court do homage before the little king Baldwin V and the Count of Tripoli. Raymond III had been regent for Baldwin IV. Now, he would be regent again. The high court imposed certain limits on Tripoli, like giving the Templars and the Hospitallers control of the kingdom's castles during the regency and appointing Jocelyn of Courtney as Baldwin V's guardian. But even after their disagreements and even conflicts, Baldwin does seem to have trusted his cousin, Raymond III. Certainly, the king now regretted ever allowing Guy of Lusignan to marry his sister. Raymond was one of the most senior members of the royal family and a proven and competent commander. It's no surprise that he resumed his role as regent for the kingdom. This business settled, the high court remained in Jerusalem, and the leper king suffered his final illness. Baldwin IV, at the end of his life, had done all that he could to secure the kingdom he so faithfully protected throughout his reign. He had dispatched a mission to the west to seek the aid of a new crusade. He had secured the throne for his nephew and attained the high court's approval for a regency. He had personally repelled one final attack during his reign on the frontier by his enemy, Saladin, and he had legally barred Guy of Lusignan from ever taking the throne. Despite the immensity of his personal suffering, Baldwin the Leper had once again demonstrated why he was so universally respected. Before Baldwin died, the High Court gathered one last time at his bedside to honor the courageous young man who had successfully guarded over Jerusalem for 11 years. The handsome athletic youth crowned in 1174 was barely recognizable. Leprosy had all but destroyed his body, rendering him crippled and deprived of most of his senses. And yet, to the last, he remained active and took steps to secure the realm. Bernard Hamilton puts it best, Few rulers have remained executive heads of state when handicapped by such severe physical disabilities or sacrificed themselves more totally to the needs of their people. During Baldwin's reign, his kingdom had been strong. Far from a waning state barely clinging to life, the kingdom of Jerusalem was economically prosperous, with a capable military well led by its king. In the face of the overwhelming power of Saladin, the kingdom stood firm under a capable ruler. The great issue Baldwin ultimately could not solve was the problem of the succession, a legacy of his leprosy. He died young, leaving no children, with his nephew and heir still a small boy. With the leper king gone, the problem of factionalism would reemerge. Baldwin IV of Jerusalem died sometime between March and May of 1185. He was not yet 24 years old. The king was buried near his father in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the site of Christ's death and resurrection and the heart of the kingdom. Baldwin ruled during the most difficult period yet experienced by the kingdom of Jerusalem, and he triumphed. He faced no less an opponent than Saladin, ruler of a vast wealthy empire, and yet the leper king emerged victorious again and again. Always, Baldwin's forces were outnumbered by the huge armies of the Sultan of Egypt and Syria. And yet, led by this stricken youth, the Crusaders prevailed. The most competent of kings would have had a difficult time dealing with Saladin, one of the most outstanding rulers in history. Baldwin IV of Jerusalem lived up to that challenge. Today, Baldwin the Leper King of Jerusalem is remembered for his heroism, his dedication, and his faith. He remains an inspiration to many, a symbol of valor in the face of danger and victory in the face of the impossible. The Battle of Montgisard remains the best symbol of his reign when the teenage leper king, flanked by a small band of Templars and knights, charged the vast forces of Saladin and won. Thanks for watching. Now, check out our full-length documentary on the life of Charlemagne, the great founding emperor of medieval Europe. Click on the video linked on your screen right now to watch. Click on the link to our Patreon to support our work, ask me questions, and get exclusive behind-the-scenes content.